Well, I think I'll start out with some of the uh, Latin riddles that I've been translating from Symphosius. I've been doing it for years, but I've got a new batch of 37 uh, to include in my next book. Let's see. Mary Cho read one of them this morning, so I won't do that. Um, well, here's a nice one. Th this one lets us know that in the ancient world, uh, the Symphosius was probably second century or fourth century, something like that. Uh, in the ancient world, it was believed that Greece uh, uh, believed, that ancient Greece believed that uh, the, the uh, crow had nine lives, a thing we have reserved for the cat. And so you need, you need that in order to respond to this uh, riddle. Nine lives I have, if Greece may be believed. I always dress in, dress in black, though not bereaved. Angry or not, I sound extremely peeved. <laughs> yeah. That could almost fit a cat, but I don't know. Here, here's, here's an informative one. Uh, I'll just tell you what it is. This, this is a, the answer to this is ball. I have no tresses, whether dark or fair. Inside, where none can see it, is my hair. Hands send me and receive me through the air. <laughs> so apparently they stuffed balls with hair in those days. It's been done since at times, hasn't it? Yeah. So. Here's one I won't tell you the answer to. Great powers I have, small though my strength may be. Doors close and open through my potency. My master's house I guard, and he guards me. Key, key. Great powers I have, small though my strength may be. Doors close and open through my potency. My the master's house I guard, and he guards me. Here's one that Mary Jo read this morning, but I like it so much I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Through middle air, where earth and heaven meet, a walker goes with steps adept and neat upon a path more narrow than his feet. That's a tightrope walker. Although, you know, uh, Will Mills was sitting next to me uh, when Mary Jo read that, and he said it applies just as well to a squirrel. And I suppose it does, really. Through middle air, where earth and heaven meet, a walker goes with steps adept and neat upon a path more narrow than his feet. Here's my favorite one, and I shall not tell you the answer right away, but I'll admire anybody who gets it. <laughs> All things I powerfully crush and blend. I have one neck with a head at either end. To more anatomy, I don't pretend. Worm? Not a worm, no. It's, the, well, it's, in, it's, it's a pestle. All things I powerfully crush and blend. I have one neck with a head at either end. To more anatomy, I don't pretend. Now here's rather a beautiful one. Um, well, no, first an ugly one. Uh, <laughs> my head is large, but what's within are small. I have one leg only, but it's very tall. Sleep loves me, but I get no sleep at all. That's an opium poppy. <laughs> And now this is, the, this is the beautiful one, which has several meanings of, of, of reed, R-E-E-D, in it. In the first place, there's the reed as a water nymph, uh, beloved of Pan. 
and, uh, and then there's the kind of reed that you find in an oboe or other musical instrument. And then if you take a reed and, and, and shave the end of it, you can dip it in ink and use it as a pen. And all of that is in this riddle. A god's sweet mistress by a river nursed, the muses caroler, in blank immersed, in black immersed, I tell by hand what head has pondered first. So that's quite a lot in three lines. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to read you now a, a, a sort of a sassy light poem. Uh, I live way out in the sticks in northwestern Massachusetts, and uh, we people who live in the sticks strike certain attitudes from time to time and thumb our noses at the city folk, and that's what's happening here in this poem called Out Here. Strangers might wonder why that big snow shovels leaning against the house in July. Has it some cryptic meaning? It means at least to say that here we needn't be neat about putting things away as on some suburban street. What's more, by leaning there, the shovel seems to express with its rough and ready air a boast of ruggedness. If a stranger said in sport, I see you're prepared for snow, our shovel might retort, out here, you'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, I'll read a few of the poems that uh, are going, I trust, into my next book. This one is called The House. Sometimes on waking, she would close her eyes for a last look at that white house she knew in sleep alone and held no title to and had not entered yet for all her size. What did she tell me of that house of hers? White gatepost, terrace, fanlight of the door, a widow's walk above the bouldered shore, salt winds which ruffle the surrounding firs. Is she now there, wherever there may be? Only a foolish man would hope to find that, ave, that haven fashioned by her dreaming mind. Night after night, my love, I put to sea. This, this was read by Mary Jo this morning, but uh, I'm, I'm fond of it. I think it's one of my most successful efforts to write uh, in um, in uh, a Japanese form, th throwing in rhymes on the first and third line. This is called a measuring worm. This yellow striped green caterpillar climbing up the steep window screen, constantly for lack of a full set of legs, keeps humping up his back. It's as if he's sent by a sort of semaphore, dark omegas meant to warn of last things. Although he doesn't know it, he will soon have wings. And I too don't know toward what undreamt condition Inch by inch, I go. This, this uh, poem is called Trismegistus, and I, I don't want to go into a great discourse on, on who he was or perhaps wasn't. Um, everything I uh, owe in the first stanza, at any rate, to the scholarship of Frances Yates and her 
a wonderful book about Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic tradition. We, kn we know Hermes Trismegistus best from his appearance in, in uh, uh, Milton's tower in, in uh, Il Penseroso. Um, well, Trismegistus. O oh, Egypt, Egypt, so the great lament of thrice great Hermes went. Nothing of thy religion shall remain save fables which thy children shall disdain. His grieving eye foresaw the world's bright fabric overthrown, which married star to stone and charged all things with awe. And what in that dismantled world could be more fabulous than he? Had he existed? Was he but a name tacked on to forgeries which pressed the claim of every ancient quack that one could from a smoky cell by talisman or spell coerce the zodiac? Still, still we summon him at midnight hour to Milton's pensive tower and hear him tell how then and now Creation is a house of mirrors, how each herb that sips the dew dazzles the eye with many small reflections of the all, which, after all, is true. <clears throat> Back in 1961, my wife and I and our children went to live in Houston for a year on a Ford Foundation grant attaching us to the Alley Theater there. And as you know, Houston has an impossible climate. And <laughs> though we loved many things about the city, we found it was necessary to drive south to Galveston very often and swim off the beaches there. And uh, this, is, this is a love poem coming out of that year. Galveston, 1961. You who, in, you who in crazy lensed clear water fled your shape, by choppy shallows flensed and shaken like a cape, who gently butted down through weeds and were unmade, piecemeal stirring your brown legs into stirred shade, and rose, and with pastel coronas of your skin, stained swell on glassy swell, letting them bear you in. Now you have come to shore, one woman and no other, sleek panoply no more, nor the vague sea our mother. Shake out your spattering hair, and sprawl beside me here, Sharing what we can share, now that we are so near. Small talk and speechless love. Mine being all but dumb, that knows so little of what goddess you become, and still half seem to be, though close and clear you lie, whom droplets of the sea emboss and magnify. Here, here's something sassy for a change of tone. Uh, this, is, uh, this is called The Censor. In any company, he listens hard for signs of vanity and self-regard, reacting to each name that's dropped, to each complacent anecdote or turn of speech with subtle indications of surprise. A wince, perhaps, a widening of the eyes, or a slight lifting of the brow addressed to the egomaniac within his breast. <laughs> <laughs> That's meant to be a, dirty, a, a violent turnaround at the end. <laughs> well.
think I'll read you now uh, a poem for my granddaughter, Amelia. Amelia is now all grown up, uh, but uh, all during her younger years, she and I picked a lot of blackberries uh, in, the, in, the, in the woods and lanes of Cummington, Massachusetts. I, I must tell you why it has the title of Blackberries for Amelia. They, I, I sent it in to the New Yorker and the editor of poetry at the New Yorker called me and said, yes, we want to take your poem, uh, Blackberries, but we can't have that we can't have that dedication underneath the title, uh, and uh, if you don't mind. And, and I said, well, I'd like, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll just shove it up in, <laughs> <laughs> into the title. So that's why this is called Bla Blackberries for Amelia. <laughs> Fringing the woods, the stone walls, and the lanes, old thickets everywhere have come alive, their new leaves reaching out in fans of five from tangles overarched by this year's canes. They have their flowers, too, it being June, and here are there in, br <coughs> in brambles dark and light are small, Five petaled blooms of chalky white, as random clustered and as loosely strewn as the far stars, of which we now are told that ever faster do they bolt away, and that a night may come in which, some say, we shall have only blackness to behold. I have no time for any change so great. But I shall see the August weather spur berries to ripen where the flowers were, dark berries, savage, sweet, and worth the wait. And there will come the moment to be quick and save some from the birds. And I shall need two pails, old clothes in which to stain and bleed, and a grandchild to talk with while we pick. I don't think I've read this ever to an audience, uh, but I know Anthony Hecht used to come here, and uh, he was a great friend of mine, wonderful poet, and uh, for his 80th birthday, I wrote this ballad. Uh, in part, I was, in part, it was a quid pro quo, because when he introduced me on a previous occasion at the Morgan Library in New York, uh, he introduced me with a ballad of his composition. <laughs> so here we go, an 80th birthday ballad for Anthony Hecht. Who is the man whose poems dare describe man's inhumanities and count our deadly sins and bear such truths as cause the blood to freeze? Yet in whose darkest verse one sees how style and agile intellect can both instruct and greatly please. I speak, of course, of Tony Hecht. Who is the man who has a flair for double dactyl drolleries and other, <laughs> and other forms as light as air that call for wit and expertise, whose Dover bitch, moreover, frees his comic gifts to play unchecked? Who is his own antipodes, the many-sided Tony Hecht, <laughs> who has translated Baudelaire, avoiding all translation ease, who rendered Brodsky and Voltaire and Horace's urbanities, and would be named by all of these as one of their august elect. Can there be any question? He's that true Parnassian Tony Hecht. <laughs> by now, Prince, you must be aware of what bard most deserves respect. There is but one beyond compare, the incomparable Tony Hecht. <laughs> I don't know what the view of this matter is in Tennessee, 
but it is felt in Massachusetts that when the barred owl cries out in the woods at night, what it's saying is, who cooks for you? <laughs> is, isn't that generally understood here as well? Yeah, okay. All right. Well, this, is, this is a poem called A Barred Owl. The warping night air, having brought the boom of an owl's voice into her darkened room, we tell the wakened child that all she heard was an odd question from a forest bird, asking of us if rightly listened to, who cooks for you? And then, who cooks for you? Words which can make our terrors bravely clear can also thus domesticate a fear and send a small child back to sleep at night not listening for the sound of stealthy flight or dreaming of some small thing in a claw borne up to some dark branch and eaten raw. <clears throat> that is, uh, I don't think it is the business of poetry uh, to, to prettify the world and defend us in that way. I think what we what we have to do is to, as this poem says, is to make our terrors bravely clear. If you can name it, it's less frightening, isn't it? I've lived in the country for most of my life, in New Jersey or Massachusetts or New Mexico, and yet I, I didn't understand until about 15 years ago what those big nests were at the top of the trees. I didn't know those were where the crows uh, uh, went to be comfortable. And this, uh, I, I, I thank my farmer neighbor, Francis Wells, for pointing it out to me. And this is called Crow's Nests. That lofty stand of trees beyond the field which in the storms of summer stood revealed as a great fleet of galleons bound our way across a moiled expanse of tossing hay, full rigged and swift and to the topmost sail taking their fill and pleasure of the gale. Now in this leafless time are ships no more. Though it would not be hard to take them for a roadstead full of naked mast and spar in which we see now where the crow's nests are. There's a Bulgarian poet named uh, Valery or Valery. I don't know how to say the name in Bulgarian. Uh, uh, let's say it's uh, Valery Petrov. Uh, with, with whom I feel a lot of affinity uh, insof insofar as I've been able to understand him. And uh, here's a poem I translated from him. It's called A Cry from Childhood. Why must it come just now to trouble me? This sudden, shrill, and dreamlike cry of children calling Valerie, Valerie, out in the street nearby. It is not for me that distant childhood call. Alas, it is for me no more. They are calling now to someone else, my small namesake who lives next door. Though such disturbances, I must admit, are troubling to my train of thought. I keep my feelings to myself, for it would be comical, would it not, if from his high and studious retreat, a gaunt old man leaned out to say, I can't come out <laughs> to the children in the street. I'm not allowed to play. There's another translation from him, which I like pretty well. The, uh, Bulgaria was occupied for a time by the Nazis, as you know. And this is called Photos from the Archives. Those manly brows, 
those eyes so steady, those mouths unwilling to betray, and under them those thin necks ready to wear a gallows rope next day. Old Nazi archives saved for us these pictures of our friends who died. Mug shots we know look always thus, full face and profile side by side. Yet sometimes guilty thoughts arise which make us fancy that those men have looked once deep into our eyes and turned their faces from us then. One more translation. Elizabeth Bishop, a while back, was putting together uh, what turned out to be an admirable anthology of Brazilian verse in translation. And this is one of the poems she got me to do. It's a poem by uh, a man evidently very uh, celebrated and popular in Brazil, Vinicius de Moraes. He was uh, a writer of pop songs, but also uh, very well known as a poet. And I judge on internal evidence from this poem that Vinicius and his wife had a first child, a girl who was still born, and then a second child, also a girl who lived. Song. Never take her away, the daughter whom you gave me, the gentle, moist, untroubled, small daughter whom you gave me. Oh, let her heavenly babbling beset me and enslave me. Don't take her, let her stay, beset my heart and win me, that I may put away the firstborn child within me, that cold, petrific, dry daughter whom death once gave whose life is a long cry for milk she may not have, and who in the night time calls me in the saddest voice that can be, Father, Father, and tells me of the love she feels for me. Don't let her go away, her whom you gave, my daughter, lest I should come to favor that wilder one, that other who does not leave me ever. There's a small body of water that flows through my woods out in Cummington, Massachusetts. I found from an ancient map that it was called Hamlin Brook, named after an old family of the town. And uh, that's the title of this poem. And uh, the occasion of this poem is my having done something sweaty in the woods, cut down a lot of trees, something like that. And now I'm down on my hands and knees uh, seeking to get a drink from the, from the brook. At the alder darkened brink where the stream slows to a lucid jet, I lean to the water, dinting the top with sweat and see before I can drink, a startled inchling trout of spotted near transparency, trawling a shadow solider than he. He swerves now, darting out to where, in a flicked slew of sparks and glittering silt, he weaves through stream bed rocks, disturbing foundered leaves, and butts then out of view beneath a sliding glass crazed by the skimming of a brace of burnished dragonflies across its face, in which deep cloudlets pass, and a white precipice of mirrored birch trees plunges down toward where the azures of the zenith drown. How shall I drink all this? Joy's trick is to supply dry lips with what can cool and slake, 
leaving them dumbstruck also with an ache nothing can satisfy. My daughter, Ellen Wilbur, is a very good writer of short stories, and she started uh, writing the stories. Now, now they're in books and magazines uh, 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 all around. Uh, but uh, she started modestly in junior high school, uh, coming home uh, most days obsessively, uh, climbing to her room on the second floor, and pretty soon one could hear the clacking of her typewriter. I've, that, that's one of the noises of this poem, which many people don't understand anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this is called The Writer. In her room at the prow of the house, where light breaks and the windows are tossed with linden, my daughter is writing a story. I pause in the stairwell, hearing from her shut door a commotion of typewriter keys like a chain hauled over a gunnel. Young as she is, the stuff of her life is a great cargo, and some of it heavy. I wish her a lucky passage. But now it is she who pauses, as if to reject my thought and its easy figure. A stillness greatens in which the whole house seems to be thinking. And then she is at it again with a bunched clamor of strokes and again is silent. I remember the dazed starling which was trapped in that very room two years ago. How we stole in, lifted a sash and retreated not to affright it, and heard, and, and, <clears throat> and how for a helpless hour, through the crack of the door, we watched the sleek, wild, dark, and iridescent creature batter against the brilliance, drop like a glove to the hard floor or the desktop, and wait then, humped and bloody, for the wits to try it again and how our spirits rose when suddenly sure it lifted off from a chair back, beating a smooth course for the right window and clearing the sill of the world. It is always a matter, my darling, of life or death, as I had forgotten. I wish what I wished you before, but harder. Well, this, I think I shall read something seasonal now. Uh, we had so much rain up north that uh, it, it seemed unlikely that anyone would ever get his vegetable garden planted. But we, we all did somehow in the intervals. Uh, and this is, a, this is a vegetable garden poem in which you, Perhaps you'll imagine yourself as down on your hands and knees, weeding in the row. This is dedicated to Robert Frost because I steal my first two lines, uh, the, rather my first two rhymes, uh, poem, Putting in the Seed. Here something stubborn comes, dislodging the earth crumbs and making crusty rubble it comes up bending double and looks like a green staple. It could be seedling maple or artichoke or bean. That remains to be seen. <laughs> Forced to make choice of ends, the stalk in time unbends, shakes off the seed case, heaves aloft and spreads two leaves which still display no sure and special signature. Toothless and fat, they keep the oval form of sleep. 
the plant would like to grow and yet be embryo, increase and yet escape the doom of taking shape, be vaguely vast and climb to the tip end of time with all of space to fill, like boundless Yggdrasil that has the stars for fruit. But something at the root more urgent than that urge bids two true leaves emerge. And now the plant resigned to being self-defined before it can commerce with the great universe, takes aim at all the sky and starts to ramify. It's a pleasure to use a word like ramify in its <laughs> real meaning. <laughs> Here's a poem called Two Voices in a Meadow. <coughs> There's a milkweed and a stone, which are sitting there in the meadow. And for some reason, they're raising their voices and in self-definition. Um, two Voices in a Meadow, the milkweed speaks first. Anonymous as cherubs over the crib of God White seeds are floating out of my burst pod. What power had I before I learned to yield? Shatter me, great wind. I shall possess the field. And the stone says, as casual as cow dung, under the crib of God, I lie where chance would have me, up to the ears in sod. Why should I move? To move befits a light desire. The sill of heaven would founder, did such as I aspire. I, I think my stone is just as spiritual as the milkweed is. <laughs> they, and uh, I, was, I was once looking through St. Bonaventure's life of uh, St. Francis, and one of Francis' followers said to him, uh, Francis, what is a holy man? And uh, Francis said, a holy man is like a dead body. If you take a dead body and haul it up onto a throne, it will be none the prouder for that. Haul him down again and throw him into the gutter and he will accept that too with equanimity. <laughs> I think my, my stone is like the, 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 the latter. <laughs> oh, I know, I've got to. I must not forget to, because the issue, the issue has not disappeared. I'm going to read you a poem called Advice to a Prophet. I was, I was on, on leave from the ETO in England when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, and one of my fellow soldiers said, I'll bet you can't write a poem about that by the weekend. And I said, no, no, it's a little big uh, for me. Uh, it took me until 1959 finally to write a poem which uh, responded, as I think one must try to respond, uh, to this uh, huge fact and threat of our, ex of our present existence the threat of, of uh, nuclear war. So this is called Advice to a Prophet. And in this case, the, the poet is, is, is being rather nervy. He is giving advice to a prophet who is going to come to his town and suggesting what he ought to say. When you come 
as you soon must to the streets of our city, mad-eyed from stating the obvious, not proclaiming our fall, but begging us in God's name to have self-pity. Spare us all word of the weapons, their force and range, the long numbers that rocket the mind. Our slow, unreckoning hearts will be left behind, unable to fear what is too strange. Nor shall you scare us with talk of the death of the race. How should we dream of this place without us? The sun, mere fire, the leaves untroubled about us, a stone look on the stone's face. Speak of the world's own change. Though we cannot conceive of an undreamt thing, we know to our cost how the dreamt cloud crumbles, the vines are blackened by frost, how the view alters. We could believe if you told us so that the white-tailed deer will slip into perfect shade, grown perfectly shy. The lark avoid the reaches of our eye. The jack pine lose its knuckled grip on the cold ledge and every torrent burn as Xanthus once, its gliding trout stunned in a twinkling. What should we be without the dolphin's ark, the dove's return, these things in which we have seen ourselves and spoken? Ask us, prophet, how we shall call our natures forth when that live tongue is all dispelled that glass obscured or broken, in which we have said the rose of our love and the clean horse of our courage, in which beheld the singing locust of the soul unshelled, and all we mean or wish to mean. Ask us, ask us whether with the worldless rose our hearts shall fail us. Come demanding whether there shall be lofty or long-standing when the bronze annals of the oak tree close. Here's a, an old poem of mine that my friend David Ferry thinks is one of my best, and so I'll read, read it in his honor. Uh, it's called The Mill. The spoiling daylight inched along the bar top, orange and cloudy, slowly igniting lint. And then that glow was gone. And still your voice, serene with failure and with the ease of dying, rose from the shades that more and more became you. Turning among its images, your mind produced the names of streets the exact look of lilacs, 193, in Cincinnati. Random as if your testament were made, the round sums all bestowed, and now you spent your pocket change so as to be rid of it. Or was it that you half hoped to surprise your dead life's sound and sovereign anecdote? What I remember best is the wrecked mill you stumbled on in Tennessee, or was it somewhere down in Brazil? It slips my mind already. But there it was in a still valley far from the towns. No road or path came near it. If there had been a clearing, now it was gone, and all you found amidst the choke of green was three walls standing hurdled by great vines and thatched by height on height of hushing leaves. But still the mill wheel turned, its crazy buckets creaking and lumbering out of the clogged race and sounding, as you said, as if you'd found time all alone and talking to himself in his eternal rattle. How should, it, how should I guess where they are gone to, now that you are gone, those fading streets and those most fragile lilacs, 
those fragmentary views, those times of day. All that I can be sure of is the mill wheel. It turns and turns in my mind over and over. I want, to, I want to end in a minute or two by reading what I think are some funny poems. Uh, but I, I, I shall <clears throat> first read, read this, this poem from one of my earliest books that was written in, the, in, in Rome. Uh, and I, I think it does help a little to, to specify that, though, though this poem could have happened in almost any city apartment in any city where people still dry their laundry out in the air. This is called, Love Calls Us to the Things of This World. The eyes open to a cry of pulleys, and spirited from sleep, the astounded soul hangs for a moment bodiless and simple as false dawn. Outside the open window, the morning air is all awash with angels. Some are in bed sheets, some are in blouses, some are in smocks, but truly there they are. Now they are rising together in calm swells of halcyon feeling, filling whatever they wear with the deep joy of their impersonal breathing. Now they are flying in place conveying the terrible speed of their omnipresence, moving and staying like white water. And now of a sudden, they swoon down into so rapt a quiet that nobody seems to be there. The soul shrinks from all that it is about to remember, from the punctual rape of every blessed day, and cries, Oh, let there be nothing on earth but laundry, <laughs> nothing but rosy hands in the rising steam and clear dances done in the sight of heaven. Yet, as the sun acknowledges with a warm look the world's hunks and colors, the soul descends once more in bitter love to accept the waking body, saying now in a changed voice, as the man yawns and rises. Bring them down from their ruddy gallows. Let there be clean linen for the backs of thieves. Let lovers go fresh and sweet to be undone. And the heaviest nuns walk in a pure floating of dark habits, keeping their difficult balance. Okay, now I want to read a couple of funny poems. Uh, this, what if you don't laugh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's a, f a, few, uh, a few years ago when my late wife was away and I at loose ends, I stayed up late and saw the uh, late movie on television, and then I saw the movie after that, <laughs> which was a remake of The Prisoner of Zenda, starring Stuart Granger and Deborah Carr. And after which, uh, I, I wrote this poem called The Prisoner of Zenda. At the end of uh, the... <laughs> At the end of uh, the prisoner of Zenda, <laughs> the king being out of danger, Stuart Granger as Rudolf Rassendil, must swallow a bitter pill by renouncing his co-star, Deborah Carr. <laughs> it would be poor behavior in him and in Princess Flavia were they to put their own concerns before those of the throne. Deborah Carr must wed the king instead. Rassendil turns to go. Must it be so? Why can't they have their cake and eat it for heaven's sake? Please let them have it both ways, the audience prays. 
and yet it is hard to quarrel with a plot so moral. <laughs> One redeeming factor, however, is that the actor who plays the once dissolute king, who has learned through suffering not to drink or be mean to his future queen, far from being a stranger, is also Stuart Granger. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, some of you will remember when that oh, happened more than once in the movies. <laughs> well, now I want to finish with some kids stuff. Uh, I want to read you a few selections from a book called uh, The Disappearing Alphabet. And it's, it's all about uh, what would we do if we didn't have the A or the B or, and so on. Here are some samples. What if there were no letter A? Cows would eat high instead of hay. <laughs> What's high? It's an unheard of diet, and cows are happy not to try it. <laughs> if D did not exist, some creatures might wish like the do dodo bird to fade from sight. For instance, any self-respecting duck would rather be extinct than be an uck. <laughs> Hail letter F. If it were not for you, our raincoats would be merely waterproof. <laughs> and that is such a stupid word, I doubt that it would help to keep the water out. Without the letter I, there'd be no word for, for your identity. And so you'd find it very tough to tell yourself from other stuff. <laughs> Sometimes perhaps you'd think yourself a jam jar on the pantry shelf. Sometimes you'd make a ticking sound and slowly move your hands around. <laughs> Sometimes you'd lie down like a rug expecting to be vacuumed, ugh. Surely, my friends, you now see why we need to keep the letter I. <laughs> Is K unnecessary? <laughs> Heavens no, it's in my name, exclaims the Eskimo. <laughs> and if there were no K, my little craft, the kayak, would be scuttled fore and aft. <laughs> no N? In such a state of things, Bird would, birds would have wigs instead of wings. <laughs> and though a wig might suit the owl, who is a staid and judge-like fowl, most birds would rather fly than wear a mat of artificial hair. What would our proud bald eagle say if he were offered a toupee? <laughs> I think it would be better then for us to keep the letter N. What if there were no letter O? You couldn't come, you couldn't go, you couldn't rove, you couldn't roam, and yet you couldn't stay at home. <laughs> Where would you be had heaven not sent you the letter O to orient you? <laughs> How strange that the banana's slippery peel without its pea would be a slippery eel. It makes you think. However, it is not profound enough to think about a lot. <laughs> what, what if the letter Q should be destroyed? Millions of U's would then be unemployed. <laughs> For Q and U belong like tick and tock, except, of course, in places like Iraq. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, without the letter U, you couldn't say, I think I'd like to visit Uruguay. <laughs> and so you'd stay forever in North Platte, New Paltz, or Scranton, or someplace like that. <laughs> <laughs> and here is, here is the last one. The letter X will never disappear. The more you cross it out, the more it's here. 
But if it vanished, treasure maps would not have anything with which to mark the spot. And treasure aisles would ring with the despair of puzzled pirates digging everywhere. <laughs> Thank you.